Hello and welcome everyone. I am uh, Anissa Avon and today um, this webinar is about open for business. Now what? How to evaluate costs, your pivot, and the implications of the pandemic on your business or department. So um, thank you so much for joining me. It's just going to be me and you guys today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just get started here. I'm going to make sure that oh, my screen is showing. All right, so our talk today, we're open for business. Um, well, we all know it's complicated. And my aim is to provide some structure and a framework around how to strategically think about your tactics and evaluate your strategy and prepare for both the short and the long-term changes that all businesses will face as we overcome this pandemic. We want to know not only how to reopen for business, but how to survive in this no money, no money to burn economy. And we wanna be able to land on a growth trajectory thriving on the other side of this. So just to acknowledge, I want to um, say thank you for joining our Leading in a Crisis Summit. Uh, we will be uh, having experts and subject matter um, thought leaders all throughout May. Um, we are, and we have over 30 something already um, recorded. So come back often, listen to the replays, um, attend one or ten, attend all up to you, whatever you find is helpful. But we're doing this every Wednesday and Thursday through May. And the intention is to bring you actionable business and HR strategies for navigating crisis and change. And we would not be able to do this if it weren't for our sponsors. So I wanna say thank you to the Whitmarsh Consulting Group, a group of super talented multi-channel marketing experts that um, are ready to serve and have some unique experiences um, helping organizations pivot during this difficult time. I also wanna say thank you to our uh, sponsor Insperity, and Insperity is HR that makes a difference. When I reached out to Insperity and said, would you be willing to sponsor? They raised their hand and said, absolutely. What can we do to help? And then I said, well, what can you offer our audience members that would be helpful at this time? And we got to talking. We talked about how most HR budgets, even if it was rock solid going into 2020, have now been crumbled up and put in the waste bin and, and because everything has changed for so many of us. Um, and they said, well, how about we enable folks with a free HR financial analysis report in debrief. And I inquired a little more, found out that that is a pretty big deal. It's going to allow HR professionals who have a budget to compare what their plans are against what really um, successful organizations do in similar stages of development and just have a confidential conversation about the real cost burdens going into 20 and, uh, 2020 and 2021 now that things have changed. So if that would be supportive of you, you can take advantage of that at turnkeycoachingsolutions.net forward slash HR report. Now I want to talk a little bit about what I call my entrepreneur genes, because I think it's important that you understand where I'm coming from um, in this webinar about, okay, how do we pivot? How do we become resilient, how do we thrive during this difficult time? So just to share a little backstory, I was born with entrepreneur genes. You see, my father was an entrepreneur, as was his father. Both sets of my grandparents were on, grandmother, excuse me, were entrepreneurs. My husband is an entrepreneur. My mother worked in our family business most of my life. And before that, she worked in her father's family business. All of us siblings, there's four of us, either have our own business or commission only salespeople. Finally, my daughter wants to be an entrepreneur. You see that handsome kid right there in the A&M shirt? That's my son. He's running as far as he can uh, away from business ownership. He wants to be a teacher, which frankly, may make him the bravest one of us all. But the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I've grown up with a business heartbeat. Um, I live it, I breathe it, I'm passionate about it. And, and so my take on business resilience is a little bit different for a variety of reasons. 
So founded Turnkey Coaching Solutions with a group of other coaches in 2004. And so as an entrepreneur, we've had to pivot ourselves many times. 2008 hit us really hard during the, the financial uh, bubble. Um, 2016, when all eyes in the entire USA were on the television set waiting um, for who was going to be our next president. Oh, I thought that was going to be the most difficult time. Um, because as we all know, learning and development is one of the first budgets that get caught. So the, the structure of my thinking is all about business resilience. And, and to be resilient in business, we got to look at the fact that we have facts, right? We know that normal life has stopped for more than a billion people, people around the world. And while some really smart folks have put forth some predictions and noteworthy forecasts, no one has a crystal ball and can, can predict with certainty what the exact path forward will require, much less the impact of this pandemic on people and society and the economy and our businesses and our culture and our relationships. So our agenda today is to put a little framework on, on what we can control and what we can put our attention upon. So we're going to talk about our first priority as business owners being uh, workforce health and safety. Um, we're going to talk about other business considerations and how to go through a checklist as we reopen for business. We're going to talk about what it means to get lean in our organizations. Um, we're also going to talk about the art of the pivot uh, and, and what that means of uh, looking at our businesses through a new lens. So the one thing I can say with confidence is that Going about our business in the same manner as we did before will not work, truly, period. And this is why Peter Drucker's quote has so much meaning for us right now. He wrote this in 1980 um, in his book, Managing in Turbulent Times. And, and it's the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but the, to act with yesterday's logic. And I want to just take a moment and say thank you guys for being here. Um, if you have any questions, am I, my screen is not showing, is it? <laughs> I thought this whole time my screen was showing. Um, so good thing I checked my text messages. Um, it says new share, share. Are you guys seeing my screen now? Okay. <laughs> my assistant just called me boomer boomer yes <laughs> so all right well well here's our slide deck now um so our agenda workforce health and safety business considerations we're going to go through a checklist um we're going to talk about how to get lean um and we're going to talk about the art of the pivot uh, as well as how to forgive ourselves when we're goofy like what i just was so um Let's get started on our workforce health and safety. We know that keeping our family uh, and ourselves and our teams, our employees and our peers and our customers safe and healthy is, is our top priority. And we know that some businesses are going to take this more seriously than others. So my intention will be to make the case for those who place health and well-being as a critical value as those who see dollar signs as more important factor may not make the necessary environment changes to ensure their families, their employees, et cetera, um, safety. So number one, it's about social distancing and physical distancing. And you're going to want to check your local and um, government regulations, as well as the fed, federal uh, regulations, as well as any industry regulations, um, such as OSHA and what have you. Um, but what we know is that you're going to want to set up your office space to take into consideration physical distancing. You're also going to want to look at your occupancy rates. Some industries, like restaurants, we know there's, a, there's an edict that says right now we're opening at 25% occupancy rates. But you also want to look at your business and what that means. 
and make some decisions about it. You're gonna to wanna to look at your cleaning procedures and create some policies around that. What about masks and personal protective equipment? You're gonna to wanna to have a conversation around, is that necessary? And even if it's not necessary, should we implement a policy about it anyway? What do we need to do to do right by our employees and of course mitigate any legal exposure if we might not make the right decision? You're going to want to make some policies about temperature testing and about symptom reporting. Now, here's the deal. You've got to be willing to post the rules, which means you've got to make policies ahead of time. And if you're already open, go back and relook at your policies and figure out how, wh what your policies are and make sure you can post them. So we want to look at things like how exactly will we enforce social distancing? What will be the consequences of that? And, and who will be in charge of enforcing it? How will we adjust our physical workspace? Will we close common areas? How might we adjust our cubicles or install partitions? Or um, we've all been in the grocery store and they've put in those plexiglass um, partitions in order to keep their employees away from customers. Um, what about non-employees? Will they be allowed on site? And if they are, what are the rules and requirement if they have symptoms or for facial masks or cleanliness, et cetera? How will we ensure a sanitized work environment? Who's gonna be in charge of that? How are we gonna check it? Are we gonna put up the little checklist everywhere we go where someone can see this restroom was cleaned uh, every 20 minutes? Um, and what about the front office space? And what about individuals' workplaces? Um, what about hallways? Are you gonna have um, one-way hallways, one-way staircases, both ways? What are your decisions there? Could PPE prevent even one exposure in your office? If so, is it worth it? How are you gonna enforce it? And under what conditions will we take temperatures and expect and communicate um, with employees about articulating when they're not well or when they suspect someone on their team is not well? So I wanna share with you guys um, something that I think could be a really cool resource for you. Um, our, one of our partners, Centrio, is um, really high quality professional compliance training provider. And they have created a free bundle of training. Um, and the bundle includes micro learning for managers supervising remote employees, micro learning for employees, work habits for remote employees, but it also includes this video which they're calling an ethical snapshot video all about virus protection. And it's a short, flexible video with just snippets around virus protection and cleanliness and disinfecting and washing your hands. And it's free and you can use it on your marquee when someone comes in, you can push it out to your employees via email or, or on your intranet. Um, but it, I would encourage you to go get it and, and use that as a resource so that you know you're articulating and communicating deliberately about your policies. You can find that at Turnkey Coaching solutions.net forward slash virus protection. So I went hunting um, for what employment law attorneys and labor attorneys are advising businesses about what to do when an employee contracts COVID-19. And in full disclaimer, um, this is not legal advice. I'm not qualified to give legal advice. So please consult your employee, uh, employer law attorney. Um, and it seems that attorneys agree that an employee's health information, including a positive coronavirus, coronavirus testing result, is protected under federal privacy laws. However, positive coronavirus testing tests by an employee is considered a work-related incident and is an OSHA reportable incident. Thus, this means we cannot disclose the name of the individual who has been tested, but we must report the positive test and we must inform everyone on our team and our vendors, our suppliers, etc., cetera, um, that when someone has tested positive, don't report their name, but we must let the other folks know you may have been exposed to someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. 
So it's important to have your policies. It's important to be clear about those. It's important to communicate those. Um, and and you're going to want to keep up with uh, HR related government compliance issues. And um, personally, I know that employment law e evolves almost on a daily basis. And certainly right now, there are some assumptions that we can make about what those compliance and policies and procedures are going to look like. So overall, my policy is do what's right, um, avoid tragedy, uh, avoid becoming a target of a lawsuit, just by simply doing everything that you can within your power to ensure a safe work environment and having high values and integrity when it comes to um, reporting, keeping others safe, contact tracing, et cetera. If you're not sure, um, I suggest meeting with a, a professional employer organization, a PEO. Of course, one of our partners um, that's sponsoring this event is Insperity. They keep track of all the compliance needs across all organ uh, across all states and districts and cities so that we don't have to um, so i highly recommend reaching out to your employment your employer lawyer <laughs> employer law uh, attorney as well as a peo um, so let's look a little bit at a checklist for reopening your your business after disaster one, a post-crisis working and business environment. We know it's not business as usual. So will we reopen the business the way it was before the crisis? Probably not. How quickly can we expect to reopen, break even, and be profitable? You're also going to want to look at how quickly can we get sales, fulfill orders, and restart our engines. You're going to want to determine the financial health of your business. You're going to want to conduct a finite financial analysis of the financial health of your business, your organization, your business unit. Uh, and that means how can we expand the business? How can we reposition our products or services? How can we shrink the business expenses? And of course, should we? And what factors indicate we should close the business? So we put together, my team actually went out and we sourced a lot of content um, with some really smart folks, even smarter than us. Um, and so all of these checklists, as well as some other resources from the CDC um, and the Environmental Protection Agency, um, we found a, a, a law firm that had a checklist on things to consider. Um, and I know that there was some issues with it earlier and, and Paige was gonna correct that. She just pasted in our little chat box, the URL, um, but you'll find a PDF that's downloadable and we'll give you, she says it's fixed, yay Paige. Um, but a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about, you'll also find in that um, resource. Guys, it's free. You don't have to give us an email address. You don't have to do anything. You just can go to that link and download that PDF. So here's a really great idea that I've talked to a lot of our clients about, and that is you want to create a reopening task force. And even if you have a small company, and even if your company is already open, and even if it feels like we got to quickly get back to business, go ahead and convene your team around reopening. And what that means is that you're going to, you're going to want to foster collaboration and by openly dialoguing about what reopening means to you and reopening means to your employees, you're going to find out who still has kids at home and, and is, are being watched by a grandmother because the daycare isn't open yet, or who's had um, some health challenges in their family, or, or possibly is even grieving, grieving the loss of someone, who's having mental health issues that you know you are going to want to support. Um, so depending on the size uh, and the structure of your organization, this task force may involve your legal department, it may involve your HR department, it may involve operations and senior managers, but this process will cultivate your champions of change. Because if you have created a task force that is then responsible for A, setting policy, ensuring policy, communicating policy, um, and supporting one another, now what you've done is cultivate some champions of change because there's going to be a lot of change. And we all know we're creatures of habit. We, we don't necessarily like change, especially if one of the changes is you're going to cut my product line. 
what am I going to do? Now my job is insecure. But if the intention is to pivot and shift, which we're going to get to in a moment, and your folks are a part of the reopening task force, then they're going to feel like they have um, skin in the game, that they've been heard, and that they have a, an opportunity to be heard. And that's important right now. You're going to want to grow alignment through this dialogue. It is not a once and done conversation. I would encourage it to be at least a couple of times a month right now. Um, and, and then you're going to, when you make policies, it, you're, not everyone has to agree with them, but having a voice and allowing people to be heard means you're going to uh, be better equipped to grow alignment. And it's really critical that your team be aligned to make some of the changes that you're going to need to make. make. The task force is about building trust, and it's about leveraging untapped talent. Right now, we have people on our teams that have been hungry for demonstrating some of their skills, um, some of which may not even know that they have skills. Um, as you all know, we know people who thrive in times of a crisis, those folks who, who suddenly blinders are on and, and they're just innovators and they create solutions and they're super resourceful. Let's find those folks on our team, get them on this task force because it's, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made and we've got to drive quickly because this is a sprint to pull off success in our businesses right now. Finally, it's about innovating. And this task force is gonna allow you to innovate. So what we know is that we don't know a lot, but what we have to do as we are preparing and planning is to also be prepared for a second wave. Um, it is possible that um, you're getting a stimulus check and your organization is getting a stimulus check and that will take you so far, but the reality is it's not gonna take us very far. So I think it's essential, not as a bummer, but to look at the world and what's happening in other countries. So perfect example is what happened with um, Haikido, Haikido's, yeah, Haikido's second wave. So Haikido was modeling the way for the perfect response to COVID-19. And that was, they contained it, they traced it, they isolated the virus, they got it down in February to one to two cases per day. So by March 19th, the state of emergency was, list, was lifted. By April 1st, schools and businesses had reopened. And by April 26th, a new state of emergency had been declared. So I'm simply suggesting that you work into your strategic plan what do we do when the second wave happens? And thus, why it's also important to talk to your suppliers and vendors. And this means you're going to be looking for um, how to directly assess your supplier's capacity to operate. You're gonna to wanna to ask questions and request evidence. One thing we know for sure is that COVID-19 is forcing companies and entire industries to reconsider their supply chain model. We know with certainty that many organizations are highly dependent on external manufacturing to fulfill their raw material needs and or their finished product needs. And in fact, did y'all know that China is, the, is basically the world's factory and more than 200 of the world's Fortune 500 global firms have a large presence in Wuhan, exactly where our pandemic originated and the worst hit province in the world. So disruption is to be expected. My suggestion is that you request, if you have a facility and you can't fly there to see it for your own eyes about how they're operating and, and their capacity, you're gonna wanna request an unscheduled live video tour of the facility. Um, and if you get the runaround on that, make some assumptions about what that means. Right now, your vendors and suppliers are trying to survive also. They need your contracts. But at the same time, they may not have the facility, the capacity, the people, um, the financial health to, in fact, pull off what you're paying them to do. So you need real facts. You need to prepare for plant closures, um, delays, and inaccurate information. 
Um, and finally, even if you have the best vendor in the world and you have proof that, that they're thriving and the gears are turning and everyone is at the job and uh, you know, no one is chained to the loom, so you're, you're doing the right thing, um, you're gonna wanna source new backup suppliers. Finally, you're gonna wanna establish some joint ventures to protect your customer relationships. And let me tell you what I mean by this. You're gonna to wanna to at least have some conversations with some of your competitors and, and form some mutually beneficial joint venture relationships. We help you, you help us. In the event that we're unable to fulfill our customers' orders, we would like to partner with you, Mr. Competitor, Mrs. Competitor, uh, in order to do right by our customers. You and I form a good relationship, we'll do the same for you. If you get in a bind, we will help you. And by doing that, you're protecting your business. You're protecting your asset for long, a short-term and the long-term survival during this crazy time. So here's something else that we know. I just wanna check my chat box, make sure you're still seeing my screen. Um, I've lost my chat box, so let me keep trying. There it is. All right. I've got a confirmation. <laughs> We're good. So, okay. There's my chat box. So the one thing we know is that our frozen economy um, we'll need some time to thaw, and, and it's complicated. Reopening is complicated, and a phased approach, uh, and timid consumers, and some industries will reopen before others, and uh, some businesses will not be able to sustain a, a flat reopening. They just won't. Um, some businesses who were barely making it before will, will simply have to fold entirely, leaving their buyers without suppliers. Um, some businesses have already shuttered their doors and some states and cities uh, will open before others and some states and cities are going to have to close back down. So what we know is that this is the time to reconsider and our, our position, our products, what we're servicing and how we do it, which means we have to become lean, mean, fighting machines. So you guys tell me if you, if you know this movie. Oh, it stopped playing. So one of my favorite movies of all time, and honestly, it's also one of my mottos when um, I think about um, the effort that needs to be made in order to restructure my business, I think about what's it going to take to be a lean, mean, fighting machine. And that means it's time to prepare for some costs. Um, and as we talked about earlier, the emergency relief funding may prop some of us up just a little bit, but it's not gonna keep a company afloat. So for the short term, we wanna look at really being smart about cutting costs. And we're gonna look at nice to have versus does it generate revenue? Convenience and ease versus is this about generate, generating revenue? Um, uh, is it about excess and, uh, uh, you know, brand luxury, or is it about generating revenue, right? And I'm going to keep saying that. Is it about keeping the business going and helping us at bare minimum break even? Um, or is it about um, what we've always done or how we've always done it? If there are aspects of your business that are underperforming, even if you don't want to cut it entirely, it may be time to um, put a stop gap in it. Stop the bleeding. If you have units, if you have software, if you have subscriptions, if you have labs, whatever it is that are underutilized, it's time to temporarily consider turning off the lights on that. Now, having said that, 
the last thing you want to do is to have your your accounting team and oh jessica said great eight great outdoors it's stripes so good guess though on the movie um, that one was from stripes with john candy and bill murray great movie i just watched it again recently so you're going to want to look at not just having your CFO or your controller cut costs. You're going to want to bring in your other folks, right? Your marketing team, your HR team, um, your business development team, your sales team, and your operations. And you're going to want to charge them with bringing you solutions. Your executive team needs solutions from the trenches. If you have uh, some organizations will just start cutting costs and they'll say the CFO will go, we got to cut that. We got to cut that. We got to cut that. And what often happens is the very thing that will allow you to pivot and shift and generate revenue is now on the chopping room floor because um, not all parties were speaking to each other. So, how many of you have heard of the $40,000 olive, right? So consider this and then tell me if you, if you recognize the company that I'm talking about. So about 30 years or so ago, um, this company did an audit and they determined that they could save somewhere, um, the, 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 the stories, and it might be some of this is a, an urban myth, but the story is that somewhere between $40,000 and $100,000 could be saved by simply cutting one olive off of, off of the plate, one olive. Um, so the man in charge um, he, at the time, his name was Robert Crandall. And he was a self-proclaimed penny pincher. So if you haven't guessed it yet, this is American Airlines. And they did indeed save $40,000 uh, on simply taking off one olive out of their first class meals. Well, a few years later, uh, United Airlines needed to shave a few dollars. Uh, a few dollars. It was part of a $200 million cost-cutting program. Cost -cutting, cost -cutting cost cutting program. And, and the way that they did it was they cut back and they removed refresher towels on short journeys. They offered fewer in-flight options for movies. Um, they also took grapefruit juice off of the menu. And all of that resulted in $200 million in savings. So you want to be able to look at what are the little things that we can do to cut costs. And over, over, um, the next month, you'll find that that makes a significant difference. So I'm going to breeze through this next section um, to give you just an idea about how you're going to want to talk to your team and your executives. Um, if you're in HR, um, you're going to want to facilitate this dialogue if they're not facilitating it um, themselves. And you want to be at the table when this is in works. But you're also going to want to understand how the, the, the cost-cutting conversation um, is is happening. So, right. So let's talk a little bit about lease space. How might we convert to virtual only? Uh, can we co-lease instead? Or can we be more efficient with our lease space? What about advertising? Can we move from brand equity advertising to lead generating ad advertising? What contracts can we pause or cancel entirely? Um, what about your marketing efforts? What's the risk if we move to uh, to organic online marketing instead of paid or vice versa. What if we move to paid online advertising, which right now you can get um, for the cheapest price that it's been in decades because so many people aren't advertising and the, the competition is less uh, online. What about going gorilla? You remember those days when you had a startup and, uh, or, or when your team was a startup and, and you really had to dig deep to find creative ways to, to generate business? This is the time for that again. What about software subscriptions? What are we not using effectively anyway? What can we move to free? There's a lot of free solutions out there, including um, uh, word processing solutions and spreadsheet solutions and CRMs. Um, so if you can move to free solutions, WebEx, uh, for example, Sheila just wrote. Uh, vendors, um, can you renegotiate? Can you price shop? And here's a really good one that you've been waiting for. Which vendors have outworn their welcome? And it's now time to cut them loose. 
Um, don't hesitate to cut some vendors loose at this time who've really not been serving your organization well. And perhaps it's just been difficult because uh, change is difficult to find someone new. Let's talk about your supplies. Can you go paperless? Can you buy generic? Can you reuse and recycle? Can you require your team to reuse and recycle? And what about convenience expenses? Uh, for example, paying uh, exorbitant shipping costs when you could travel and buy it locally. You're gonna to wanna to look at what's the ROI. Um, can we move our sales team to performance-based pay? If you're not sure that your sales team can meet the quota that they need to meet in order to produce the um, margins that are required for you to stay afloat, then you may want to have a conversation with them about performance-based pay. Um, a lot of organizations are doing this and it's a necessity. Um, it's possible that you could lose some of your sales team that way, but the truth is, is if you're not breaking even, how long can you go without moving to performance-based pay? Um, what about each employee? Can you outsource or use gig freelancers instead? And how might outsourcing cut some of your costs? Um, can you create an intern program? What about leveraging untapped talents? How can you keep your real high performers and leverage them more fully? What about your customers? Which customers are a pain or cost more to keep, cost more to service? It's time to cut them loose too. Serve your primary customers better and, and look and see how you can do more with those customers who are your primary revenue generators. So one of the things that I wanted to briefly mention as we're talking about shifting and strategy is our team has put together a data-driven crisis strategy program to help organizations pivot and shift. Um, it's, a, it's, a pro, it's a facilitated process done by strategic planning and strategic alignment experts where we assess help you create an action plan and help you get your team aligned. So all the pieces we've been talking about, um, we actually are experts at maneuvering teams into this place of alignment with crystal clear, actionable strategies. So reach out if we can support you in that. Now we're gonna talk a little more now about the art of the pivot. And there's a really good example um, in Forbes magazine this week called 10 Examples of How COVID-19 Has Forced Business Transformation. And what I found interesting, um, HubSpot did a research um, article and they took data from over 70,000 global customers. Um, and, and of course, what they saw is what we all know, that there is mass slowdown in business. But what we found interesting is that there's um, an increase in sales outreach but as you know, a decrease in response rate to typical sales outreach. However, what they also found was that there was an increase in people opening their emails, an increase in people um, answering their telephones, and an increase in interaction with online marketing and online um, advertising portals, which is a pretty interesting statistic. I guess we're all at home and have a little more time um, to click emails. Uh, for example. So you're going to want to revisit your business model. Let me give you some examples of how other organizations are pivoting. Commercial airlines are offering cargo flights. Hotels offering day rates for work from home employees uh, who can't get anything done with their toddlers around. Um, restaurants moving to sell fresh groceries and meats. Um, Patagonia uh, expanded their shelf stable items. General Motors took their self-driving cars and they're making food deliveries. Um, fitness companies have moved their workouts online. We have a, 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 we'll call her a friend of a friend of ours who had struggled to have her own yoga business for years. I'm talking maybe 15, 18 years. And she moved everything online and she's been super successful and profitable for possibly the first time in her business. So let's talk a little bit about diversifying your revenue. There's three things that you're going to want to look at because diversifying revenue comes down to changing one, two, 
or all three of these components. It's one, what you sell, who you sell it to, and how you deliver it. So it's about repositioning. So we're gonna look at your existing products and juxtapose those, those existing products against growing markets. But you're also gonna to wanna to look at what do we sell, but what do consumers need, need right now? If I sell funny t-shirts and nobody's buying funny t-shirts, then that's not what my consumers need right now. Um, although funny t-shirts are probably a good business right now. We need, we need a little more levity in our lives today. You're also are gonna wanna look at potential growth industries and how what you do can align with some of those growth industries. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. You're gonna to wanna to look at emerging and growing markets. And, and I just did a quick study online on top 100 emerging and growing or growth markets during COVID-19. And this is just a few of them that came up. And so I chose the ones that make perfect sense. Cybersecurity, baby supplies and childcare, credit score management, telemedicine, Telemedicine has exploded. We've all, uh, many of us have used telemedicine or at least heard of telemedicine. Well, I would bet money on that roulette wheel that after all of this is over, we are gonna see a significant shift in more and more people calling their dog for a video uh, meeting as opposed to going into the office. So that is gonna continue to be a growing field. Um, financial health consulting, financial health consulting and apps, big, um, uh, shift in that market uh, right now. Here's something, if you're a consultant or you know supply chain or you have been laid off of your job and you know supply chain, we are going to see in the next five years massive changes in our supply chain and supply chain, uh, supply channel innovations. And an organization or a company that can support that, they're gonna, they're gonna see some nice growth. Um, home renovation and home improvement, seeing a lot of folks at home uh, finally getting to their, uh, you know, redoing their bathroom or their kitchen or their closet right now. Um, software as a service around productivity, performance, HR, gaming, lots of growth right now, social connection and sharing apps, online education, and of course, gigs and side hustles are seeing a lot of traction right now. Um, the reason I'm sharing all of that with you is because it really is about looking at what you do. What do I sell? Who do we sell it to? And how are we going to fulfill it to see where can we pivot? And so this is a really good example. Everly Well is a startup organization. And in a recent Inc. Magazine article written by Tom Fest, uh, Foster, editor at large, he did a really good article at sharing um, Julia Cheek. That's who this you see in this picture here. She's the CEO and founder of Everly Well. Um, they are a at-home testing uh, company and their startup and they had um, done several rounds of funding and long story short they still weren't expected to be profitable for at least another 18 months to two years and so she was it, it, being interviewed on a podcast and the interviewer said how come you're not doing COVID-19 testing and her answer was you know we're a startup how are we supposed to get involved with that and she started thinking about it after that. And, and she talked to all of her independent labs and, and they were like, you know, the federal government is gonna work with our, you know, our two largest labs in the US. They're the ones that are gonna do this. Well, she kept watching the news and realized that's not what was happening. So she called up her board, they had an emergency meeting and she said, listen, we have an opportunity here. It's different than what we had planned, but if we can pull this off, we might be able to shift and change the entire trajectory of our business right now. And she talked her board into uh, funding a million dollars and she split that up into those independent labs so that they had the money they need to start um, testing and figuring out how they're gonna uh, fulfill um, COVID-19 tests and, and make that part of their service offering. They did that in two weeks. So not all of us, right, have a million dollars to pivot, but it's bold action that even considers the fact that we can. So you're going to want to reevaluate. You're going to look at your low margin goods and services, and you're going to want to change it. Push the push the pause button on those or reshift them. I want to give you an example. Bombas 
really cool online sock retailer. I think they're a $170 million company now. Who knew that you could open up an online sock company and do so well, right? Well, at the time when COVID-19 was first starting, uh, in the U.S., their message was all about athletics and being outdoor, and 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 they had to shift it quickly because people aren't weren't outdoors anymore, and you don't want to appear tone deaf, which we'll get to in a moment. So they shifted to indoor comfy. They saw a boost in sales. Then they realized our marketing spend has to change. They realized that digital ads were cheaper, so they started spending more on digital ads, boosted their revenue again. They always have had a buy one sock, we'll give a sock away. But then they decided that a lot of the organizations where they were collaborating with were very busy helping frontline workers, healthcare workers, et cetera. And, and that there was a need in the homeless shelters um, for additional support beyond socks. So their charitable partnership team went out and formed a bunch of charitable relationships with other vendors and now they're providing sheets socks soap and who knows what else so they rallied around the situation to repurpose and reposition and reevaluate what they do and how to do it to show up for this crisis we want to look at repurposing your skill sets what does your team do well that we can reposition them to do different uh, Bettina says, I like bold action. I am with you there, girlfriend. Um, I want to give you just a couple of examples of what we've done um, at the risk of, of appearing, um, I don't know, self-advertising. Um, but I'm really proud of our team. Um, we started pivoting um, early April. And since then, we've revamped our outplacement packages. We've created a scalable digital outplacement um, package for enterprise solutions. It's incredibly slick and sophisticated and inexpensive. We've created a career coaching for, uh, program for laid off employees. We've created the crisis strategy planning program, very different. We've created um, virtual training to address the needs of right now, crisis management, emotional intelligence, business continuity, the art of the pivot, and um, created some BOGO, meaning if you if an organization hires us for one team, they get a second team training for free. Um, we've also partnered with a number of organizations. I think the last time I checked, it was half a dozen organizations. Um, and I won't go into all of those, but one of those examples I mentioned earlier, the compliance training organization that's offering free courses on remote work and um, the sanitation um, and hygiene video. So all of that happened in a matter of a nanosecond. Um, uh, Paige on our uh, team, she said, it's kind of amazing how much we've accomplished in such a short time when typically it could take us months to pull off this kind of a, of a shift. Um, so so repositioning your skills to be what the market needs um, has now resulted in us also being contacted and called to manage other virtual summits like this leading in a crisis summit. We now have clients who are asking us to help them pull off their own virtual summits, which is so much fun in my mind. So. We're going to talk a little bit now about repositioning your brand's message. What worked for marketing six months ago isn't going to work today. And people are in a different mindset. The messages they'll connect with have changed. What grabbed their interest in the past might actually trigger them today. And in fact, we're seeing that. Um, I am not uh, a... a mm, going to go into all of the different tone deaf things that we've seen, but I do want to show you just a couple here. Um, if you haven't seen uh, on YouTube, you can, you guys can check this out. I'm going to make sure there it is. The relationship between social media and brands has evolved from novelty to primary means of communication. And with that has come a distinct increase in the speed with which brand mistakes are noticed, called out and savagely mocked. That cycle is now immediate and unforgiving, and many major brands have barely or unfairly felt its wrath. But let's talk about the ones who deserved it, shall we? Let's take a look at some of the worst brand failures of the decade. Just say the names Kendall Jenner and Pepsi together, and everyone knows what you're talking about. You know, that time in April 2017 when Jenner stopped a riot and impending police brutality situation simply by giving a copper can of soda. It landed at a time when the national conversation around police brutality was intense and only getting louder. 
The reaction online was immediate. SNL spoofed it, and the overall impact was strong enough that even six months later, Jenna was in tears talking about it on the season 14 premiere of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Maybe there was something in the brand there in April 2017, because Adidas also made a major mistake that month. Three years after the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, Adidas sent out an email to those that finished the 2017 race with the subject line, Congrats, you survived the Boston Marathon. Yikes. The brand quickly apologized, saying in a statement, We deeply apologize for our mistake. The Boston Marathon is one of the most inspirational sporting events in the world. Every year, we're reminded of the hope and resiliency of the running community at this event. In late so that gives you an idea. Um, it is really important to really look at our messaging to make sure that we're not behaving in a tone deaf manner. Um, we, we, you don't want to, we don't want to act like um, our business is, is um, like it's business as usual in our advertising and our marketing. We certainly don't want to also act like our outbound sales approach should be business as usual. Hey, how are you? Good, good, good. Can you buy my stuff? I mean, it's just a horrible idea. Um, we're going to have to retrain our sales team on a consultative sales approach and, and how to demonstrate empathy and how to give more at this time than ask for, uh, ask, than asking for others to you know, buy stuff from us. And the organizations that are finding ways to give as opposed to ask, ask, ask are, are finding um, successful um, opportunities. Um, we wanna acknowledge the situation with our, with our customers. And I wanna give you an example of that. Um, Corona beer, um, I was really a, a little concerned ab about them when I first uh, heard about the flack that they were taking over this. So uh, in April, Corona beer had still, weeks into the pandemic, Corona beer had not changed their website or their marketing at all. They were still, you know, scantily cad, beautiful men and women on beaches running and drinking their Coronas and having a great time, which we love when it's not a pandemic. Um, but because of Corona's brand, they took a lot of flack over the insensitivity of not acknowledging the situation. And that can really hurt our brands um, very quickly with social media. Well, Corona heard, and this is what you'll find on their website today. We're donating $1 million to restaurant. <clears throat> I can't believe I just got chucked out, choked, choked up over that. <laughs> restaurant Employee Relief Fund. Um, learn more at RURF.us. We are committed to protecting this. And then Corona Beer, of course. So as we come to a close of our time together, if you have questions, I would, I would welcome uh, the opportunity to, to share more. Um, I think that this last video that I want to share with you really demonstrates what we're all wanting um, each other to know right now. Over our 260 years, we've been through a lot, and we're confident if we all support each other, we will come out of this closer than ever. Now we're going to say something we never thought we'd say. Don't toast with your friends. At least not up close and personal. But... Remember, a toast isn't just about raising your glass, it's about raising each other. And even though we can't toast physically, we can toast virtually. Share a pint with your friend. Try a new kind of happy hour. This is not only a time to be safe, but a time to be good to each other. Text your neighbors, see how they're doing. Call your grandparents. Let them hear your voice. And don't worry, when the time is right, we'll meet you in the club. We'll help our bartenders get back in their feet, and we will all toast again. As for us, we signed a 9,000 year lease now, Brilliant. But so we're not going anywhere. Really nice. Um, okay, that's twice now I've gotten choked up over <laughs> commercials and marketing, for heaven's sake. Somebody help me. <laughs> so. Um, the workforce reentry guidebook that I mentioned earlier, there's that link. Um, a lot of the checklists that you guys will want, um, uh, as well as some other resources are available in that. Um, I hope that you have found this helpful. Um, if I may personally support you, don't hesitate. There's my uh, a way to, to contact me. 
and um, a way to contact Turnkey. Um, it would be our privilege and our pleasure to support you and your organization as you get back to work and prepare for both the short and long-term success of your employees and your organization. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, having this opportunity to support you.